Hello, today I thought I'd have an in-depth look and show you how I painted this painting. Some preliminary discussions, how I'm thinking about things, materials and techniques. I hope you find it useful. So here are some reference photographs that I've taken. This is the sort of landscape I'm thinking about when I'm painting these paintings. So this is the sort of equipment I use, fairly standard stuff. Kitchen paper, always useful to have when you're painting with watercolour. Spray bottle, I use that quite a lot. Not everybody does. A simple palette, I know there are people who have paint on their palette for literally years without ever cleaning it, but I much prefer to start with, with a clean palette. That works for them, but it doesn't really work for me, I'm afraid. It also lets me use different colours. Not always sticking to the same range of colours, and if I need two palettes, I, I use two palettes. That I used to, that big house painting brush, I used to wet the paper often. This is a, an oil bristle brush, fairly cheap, which I have clipped the end, the bristles on the end with a nail clipper to make the end very uneven. I think you can see there how uneven it is. Not sure Winsor and Newton, what size it is. Number nine, I think. <laughs> Was it a nine or a six? And as you can see, them trying to point out that the the end the end is very very uneven. These are some synthetic brushes from Roseman Company. A reasonably new series of brushes called Red Dot. different sizes, uh, a rigger in the same series and something I've been using recently, a ruling pen, which if you're not familiar with it, you can see how that works, I hope. That's now out of focus, but there are two blades of metal which you control the distance between them by tightening or loosening that little dial or knob on the side there and fill it up so fill the paintbrush with, with paint and then just lay that across the ruling pen and the paint fills the ruling pen and then you can use it so that's basically the most of the equipment so now we can talk about colors for a minute this is the range of colours I'll be using in this painting. A simple guide if you want to create uh, atmospheric perspective in a painting is things that are further away are contain less yellow. It's, it's really quite simple. We've all seen pictures of mountain ranges in the background where they look purple. They're not actually purple in real life as we know, but the blue atmosphere between you and the mountains tends to decrease the yellow in the colours. So we're starting with this Haradam super granulating, deep sea green. I know it doesn't look very green, but that's what they call it. Deep sea blue. Now a much stronger green, the sap green from Coal. This is the um, Thalo Yellow Green from Daniel Smith, which I use for highlights. And then to make darker versions of those colours, mixing in some Imperial Purple, also from Daniel Smith. Possibly some Brown Madder, a Red Ochre, and the Aussie Green, uh, sorry, 
I'll see red gold, green gold. I'll see red gold. For um, strong sunlight effects, which I can enhance by lifting the colour before it dries with the uh, kitchen roll. So you get very strong highlights. So let's talk a little bit about composition. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the rule of thirds, where you divide your paper up into three equal sections, horizontally and vertically. Um, so these are a couple of small sketches, one-fifth scale, um, just to keep the same proportions as the finished painting. And I don't usually sketch things up for myself. As you can see me there indicating the, the thirds I've divided the, um, the sketch up into and then just on the one on the right there just indicated the same thirds on the edge. And if you're not aware then this is the importance of these positions on the paper where the thirds cross each other top left number one, top right number two, bottom right number three, and bottom left number four. Now, I don't know why it's like this, but they have um, bounced lasers from people's eyes, and when they look at a picture, this is how they do it. This is where the eyes go. They keep coming back to that number one spot. As I say, don't ask me why it's like that, but um, that's the way it is. So here I've, as I've said, marked small ticks around the outside so that there's nothing on my sketch, but I do have these thirds in mind when I'm doing these paintings. So we can start by sketching in the trees in the distance, more or less on the, uh, on that first third there. And as I usually do, the leftmost tree, slightly taller than the others, just to stop your eye travelling too far to the left. And just gently sketching in. Now that third there is the one I'm going to highlight by not painting anything on it. Just going to leave that as clear as I can. Same approach there, tallest tree on the right. And leaving that third clear quite, um, quite simply. And then moving forward to create some depth in the sketch, just simply pushing harder with the pencil Slightly smaller trees, but still the same type of pine tree. And starting to indicate some sort of ground level on the lower third. I'm sure you also know that um, a horizon, you should avoid having the horizon in the middle of your painting. And still thinking about the thirds still leaving it clear, the one on the right hand side starting to sketch in the ground showing the sunlight hitting the ground there strongly and then starting to add trees which are closest to you and these pine trees, they do have a, a habit of growing quite a few number of feet up into the air before producing any branches and certainly before producing any foliage. So still maintaining that open space in the middle there and the trees on the right leaning slightly to the left and the trees on the right, on the left sorry, leaning slightly to the right 
And so if we zoom in a little bit, just to carry on, again pushing harder, thicker trunks of the trees, the closer you are, the closer they are to you, but also thinner, younger trees to create contrast. Not just the same thickness of the trees all the time. Still maintaining that um, open area along the third. And now I'm actually going to mark the point where those two thirds cross each other and have that as my vanishing point in the picture. So that when it comes time to add the shadows, we can use that vanishing point to add all of the shadows so that they all appear to be coming from the same light source, quite simply. And then just a few smaller details. And then just strengthening the, the feeling of light hitting the ground by creating a darker shade further away. And now we can look at actually painting some of these trees. And as you can see, I usually use a large brush lots of paint, pushing quite hard at the base of the tree and gradually letting the brush, releasing the pressure so that the line becomes thinner and, and thinner. And then we can at that point switch to a thinner brush, in this case the rigger, and if you end up with a little sort of blob like that, you can always make it into a branch going up at the side. And then just some trees painted all of them with the rigor. trees in the background, painted using a, a stipple motion as you can see I'm just dabbing the end of the brush more or less at 90 degrees to the paper. I'm always thinking in terms of the trees, the branches on, on this sort of tree growing uh, upwards at an angle. And then in these paintings, I spray, spray the bottom of the tree with water to essentially lose the bottom of the tree. And one brush I forgot to show earlier on, this synthetic flat brush. For the broader trees. And what I'm doing here is instead of lifting the brush off the paper I'm actually twisting it. I hope you can see that. So that you end up with a thinner. Now that's quite exaggerated that decrease in thickness of that trunk but the, the principle holds good. And then you can do some, add some thicker branches with the edge of the flat brush and then the thinner branches with the rigger.
that little <clears throat> bit there I don't actually mind that that's me spraying the bottom of the, the blue tree and it uh, has caught the the trunk of that thin one it could be some moss or something growing on it and as I showed previously filling the ruling pen always test it before you use it obviously not on the finished painting <laughs> get get the spray bottle out of the way and use it for the very finest of the twigs you need to be a little bit careful with the ruling pen because if the paper is still damp at all it will come out much thicker than you want it to And as I've mentioned, dis um, adjusting the distance between the two bits of metal, and as you can see, they're slightly thicker. And you do need to be careful when you're painting that thick because the paint stays wet for quite some time. You need to make sure you don't smudge it. See, as I did there, just to show you how. You end up with a little sort of bead of paint sitting on the paper and it takes a while to dry. I always, or most of the time, loosen the bottom of any tree trunks so that they appear to meet the ground in a natural way. And then a technique I learned many years ago, holding a ruler at an angle. If you're not confident of painting more or less a straight line, you can try this. You can actually vary the line so it's not 100% straight just holding the, the ruler at about 45 degrees and resting the metal ferrule of the brush or the metal part of the brush against the ruler. You can do it with thicker brushes if you want to. And again, learning to vary the pressure on the brush so that the line varies in thickness. Always a slight problem when you have a little bit of a gap but you can always fill that in later. And again another technique using if you've got the edge, if you're close to the edge of your pad or board, resting your hand on the actual edge which lets you paint more or less parallel to that edge. This is the paper we will be using. Ash, rough, 300 grams, 140 pounds, so grand trochon, as the French say. Rough helps with the granulation. The rough surface helps with the granulation. Now, many people think it's um, okay just to leave the paper machine on the pad since the edges are sealed all the way around, but I actually prefer to stretch the paper. So I usually just run my scalpel handle around to get the paper from the off the pad. And now I'll show you how I stretch it using paper tape with glue on one side 
just simply tearing off four lengths, one for each side. So follow me, I'll show you how to stretch it. I'm lucky enough to have a, a large sink at home. So just to put a couple of an inch or so, half inch or so of water in the sink and drop the paper in the water, obviously. It's all a bit um, crowded in there. <laughs> we can just step over the tripod for the camera. So after a couple of minutes, let the excess water drain off. And that board is what, half inch ply, something like that, 12 millimeters. And just drying the edges. An ordinary sponge, just run the paper against the sponge. And then I like to Really push my finger into the uh, tape up against the edge of the paper to make sure we get a good, good, good contact all around, and then just leave it all to dry. And here it is. And now, as you can see, I've marked the thirds on the outside of the paper, so we can relate to the, uh, the sketches I did earlier. And then starting with the deep sea green, quick test on some spare paper. Still think it looks more blue than green, but it uh, it works very well for these paintings. And I usually have one tree disappearing from the top of the paper. And as you can see, angling the brush upwards. And varying the size of the trees. Not all the same size. It's feeling a bit dry at the moment, so just a quick spray with the spray bottle. Just a quick spray on the right hand side in preparation for me painting there shortly. As we've discussed, the that particular third we are going to highlight it by not painting anything there. slightly stronger version of the colour just to give the impression that it is further forward
quick visit from the cat there, as per usual. This is the deep sea blue. The stronger mix so that the tree I'm painting there looks to be further forward, nearer the viewer. So as you can see, a combination of painting, spraying and just wiping up the excess with kitchen paper. And just trying to loosen the edges of the far trees there without letting them bleed too far. And the important cup of tea. And at this point we're going to, everything's looking the way we want it, so we'll just dry it off and lock everything into place. Although some of the edges are looking a bit hard, so just loosening those before I dry it. Which you didn't get to see, and still using the same approach darker version of the deep sea blue, creating contrast with the trees behind. And again, just loosen everything, especially the lower part. just thinking about these photographs of small young pine trees. What do they look like? How do they grow? Can they grow in small groups together? And then adding a touch of the I'll see um, red gold just to vary the colour slightly. And having used that colour. Adding a little bit more of the, or, or introducing a warm colour along more or less where we've decided the horizon is, 
although a little bit lower, obviously. And again, very loose, indistinct connection to the ground, not sure where the ground is exactly. And an even stronger mixture of the colour and again leaving them, making sure to leave that third completely clear. You can start to encroach into it a little bit at this point. And so building up layers of paint to create a feeling of depth. And having used that slightly more yellowy green on the left, we use the same colour on the right to create a little bit of balance. and trying to create a feeling of you can move round the trees, you could walk into that distance, deliberately not creating any sort of barrier, going all the way across the painting. I nearly always leave a path into my um, landscapes that I create. Sometimes I don't. And as you can see, I'm just making up everything as I go along at this point, even though I have, I did do that little sketch. And here we can start to define the ground proper. I'm just making sure everything is soft at the moment. Deciding it all looks the way I want it to look. A quick go with the uh, hair dryer. Now it's not quite dry, didn't dry it off completely, so that this tree I'm putting in here is bleeding quite a lot into the background, which I don't really mind. But deciding that I'm going to wait to uh, let that dry a little bit more and work on the left hand side instead which has dried completely so that we get much better definition and as i said um, when we're discussing the colors if you want things to look far away you reduce the amount of yellow in them and if you want things to look close to the viewer then include quite a lot of yellow so this is a nice strong green, works very well in this context I think. and retaining quite a lot of definition in that tree. And 
just a quick hint of a a shadow on the ground there and then starting to introduce some much warmer colors and um, the color I hadn't mentioned earlier on which is a red ochre using the same color on the right hand side just to create a bit of balance not really thinking in terms of actual bushes or anything like that it's just implying some sort of growth and now mixing the Aussie red gold for the sunlit part of the ground I'm starting to tie it in with the existing And as you can see, just little flicks of the brush just to create the idea of grass possibly or something growing up from the ground in any case. And here, as you can see, I'm deliberately pointing the brush strokes on the ground, pointing them towards the vanishing point. As if we have beams of light coming from the vanishing point so let me just showing there how I'm thinking and gradually getting darker and darker the further away from the most sunlit part so this is the red ochre with um, a touch of the purple in it As you can see, still using the same, the same br bristle brush so that the brush strokes are very un uneven. and quite a lot more of the purple and a mixture of the Aussie red gold, the red ochre and the purple just as I demonstrated earlier on with the colours just picking out the lifting the uh, Aussie red gold which leaves a beautiful stained yellow paper and really suggests strong sunlight hitting the ground at that point That's more imperial purple I'm mixing there. A bit of spattering just to create some texture in that area, which was possibly a little bit bland otherwise. Um, trying to avoid the sunlit area, but create some texture in the ground nearest to us.
getting a little bit up in the sky there, but not too worried about it, to be honest. I could have covered the sky with paper to protect it, but as I say, I'm, I'm not all that bothered, to be honest. And doing this battering while the background paint is still damp so that it mixes. Just actually drying those just so I don't smudge them at any point. Because that I wouldn't I wouldn't be too happy with. And still indicating that the um, I'm still emphasizing that third in the in the picture. And the sunlight and the shadows on the on the bushes and the ground. And at this point I think we're going to start painting the closer trees and as I've shown just a quick dab just to so that I know I'm going to start painting. And as I draw in the sketch, trees on the left bending ever so slightly to the right. And if you get an obvious change in thickness, just make it make it into an outgrowth and a new branch growing up. Same on the left hand side, sorry the right hand side. Can't tell the difference between left and right anymore. The right hand side and the tree leaning slightly to the left. Just to keep emphasizing that third. Slight curve on that one. And just dabbing the bottom of the tree just to lose it in the foliage. And as you can see, um, fairly pure purple, in fact, pure purple, quite dilute. So these trees are actually transparent. Just to give the feeling of the being further away in the picture. Creating a variation in the colour of the trees. So that's a reasonably strong mixture of the deep sea blue. Same approach. Deciding that wasn't quite thick enough. So something I don't often do, going over the same line again. I tried to paint the, the trunks of the trees just with one brush stroke and leave it at that but sometimes I will adjust them and 
looks like they've drunk a blend of the purple which has a touch of a very small amount of the green in it Just having a quick think about where I want the trees to go. That one veering off to the right instead of the left. And just dabbing the trunk there creates a little bit of texture. But again, still transparent. And using the same mix on the left hand side. And that's a fairly strong mix of the red ochre, which I'm adding to the sap green and the imperial purple. So you can see that the um, the colour I'm mixing there, it's at the moment a dark green, so a touch more of the red ochre. And having a quick think again, where do I want this tree? It's going to be quite dominant because of the, uh, the value of the colour. So a bit further forward, which means that the, the bottom of the trunk starts lower down in the painting so that it feels like it's essentially closer to you, the viewer. Same approach to tie the tree into the uh, landscape. Just a quick spray and then if that spreads too far just a quick dab with the paper. And again Sometimes we can use a finger instead of paper. I do find it difficult to those branches going off the left. The main trunk is still not dry, so I have to be very careful to not smudge that, which is quite often why you see me leave the branches going off the left initially, just paint the ones going off to the right. And here we have the flat brush and the technique I showed you earlier on where I rotate. Something I try and avoid actually is that sort of dabbing it can produce undesirable results. As you can see, it doesn't take much to get the feeling that the tree is sitting on the ground. And putting these trees in creates immediately the feeling of much more feeling of depth. I do have a habit of completely unconsciously 
spacing things evenly. It's not something I think about, which I ought to think about, but I do end up creating even spaces. So with more work and more trees we can reduce that effect. And as I showed in the demonstration at the start, using the edge of the board, as a guide for my hand. Here I've decided that I don't necessarily need to stick to completely vertical trees. Sometimes something happens to them when they're just starting to grow and they grow at an angle. And filling up the, um, the brush with a certain amount of paint, you'll see that it depletes as I paint and the top of that tree is much paler which suits the fact that the light is strongest there so I don't have a problem with that in fact it's quite desirable and again the same effect there So I'm still hoping you can feel like you can walk into the picture. That's the intention in any case. Still just try to break up that area a little bit, like make it feel a little bit more organic. Just strengthening that branch, as you can see. And again, not all trees are completely vertical. really trying to create the contrast between the heavier thicker trees and much thinner trees I'm thinking it's feeling a bit bare on the left hand side there
So mixing a strong color for the moment is most, <clears throat> mostly the sap green. Adding purple. And again turning the board. Time for the rolling pen. Always test it before you use it on your painting. And as I say, avoid using it on areas of the paper that are still damp because it will flood the paper at that point. Here I'm just thinking about the balance of the whole painting, waving my hand about deciding where to add the really thin lines produced by the rolling pen. just introducing the slightly uneven lines to create um, a more organic feel. And just holding that brush in place to see if I need a dark tree in that space there. It doesn't need to be very much. And just gradually closing in on the space that's available there. Using perspective to lead your eye towards that position. And a dead branch lying on the ground. I think I'm getting fairly close now to having the number of trees that the, um, the whole composition feels balanced. And now I'm going to just show you the same thing I showed on the sketch 
previously but not wanting to draw on the actual painting but I'm just going to put in a, a vanishing point on the thirds so that's just an ordinary bit of masking tape and I'm going to use that as the vanishing point for all of my shadows So that's how it's going to work. I'm just showing you quickly how I'm thinking. And if you're a bit uncertain, you can use the trick of painting along a ruler, which I showed you. I prefer just to eyeball it. So, but there, from there, going that way. Same there. And sometimes painting uneven shadows to imply that the shadows are falling across bushes or foliage of some description. I'm not too worried about being 100% accurate about exactly where the shadows should be falling. Working on the shadow for this fallen branch was a bit tricky. time for a bit of spattering. It's all fairly dry at the moment so that's going to stay. More or less the way I have painted it there or created it. Being careful to avoid the lightest areas. I'm trying to build up more in the corners. And then just implying some leaves on the trees by the same method. and some pure purple don't feel the need to be restricted by the fact that most trees are green or brown you can paint purple trees if you want to with purple leaves Getting a few leaves floating around in midair, but uh, not worried about that. And then just loosening these areas with the spray bottle. I don't want any wet areas running 
towards me, so laying the board flat on the desk. And apparently late in the day deciding that no, I actually need another tree there. I was feeling a bit, a bit too open. And strengthening that area there as well. It's the perennial problem, the curse of all artists, when to stop, when is enough enough. And a fairly thick mixture of the thalo yellow green, which is partially um, opaque, I think.
a bit careful not to splash everywhere. And laying flat again because I don't want any runs anywhere. And the similar, just loosening those recently splattered areas, just loosening that with the spray bottle. And there it is, there's the finished painting. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it useful. I hope you picked up a few tips and tricks. If you did find that useful and enjoyed it, don't forget to please subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.